Hello, History 363. So it's kind of the last part of our culture and society uh, kind of smorgasbord. I want to talk a little bit about the development of Roman literature, um, which eventually involves the development of Latin literature, literature in the Latin language. Um, by and large, this is a third century BC phenomenon when Roman literature really gets started. Um, and it's notable that this really does correspond with, um, in many ways, uh, at least as a kind of catalyst, the extraordinary uh, violence um, of both Punic Wars, but eventually especially of the Second Punic War. Um, and uh, a sort of a big war uh, as being a kind of um, uh, you know, a ignition, a igniter of, uh, of a kind of wave of national literature, um, I don't actually think is necessarily surprising. One can actually think about the sort of bursts of American literature that happen after the Civil War, after World War I, with uh, you know, folks like Fitzgerald and uh, John Dos Passos, um, and of course the, the big explosion of literature in kind of a generation after World War II. Um, that isn't to say that war is the only thing that sort of prompts literature, um, but certainly uh, uh, warfare, particularly a kind of existential war like the Second Punic War, um, can uh, create a kind of national consciousness um, that leads to uh, a more deliberate literary expression. Um, commemorating the war, especially if you won it and are really proud of it, um, can also uh, prompt uh, literary activity. And of course, you know, literary activity oftentimes begets literary activity. So again, warfare is a catalyst, not um, uh, the source of all literature. Um, uh, and um, uh, so uh, I think it's therefore not kind of, uh, it's not surprising that necessarily there's a huge burst of Latin literature, um, particularly after the Second Punic War. Um, uh, uh, so, um, at any rate, um, what I just sort of wanted to do was talk about some of the early Roman authors, many of whom don't survive uh, hardly at all or only survive in fragments. Um, and one thing that I kind of want to note when we think about literature and the social and uh, kind of cultural aspects of literary production, um, uh, we actually sort of see two tracks of literary production. On one hand, history, the, the writing of history, um, is a largely senatorial activity. So most of our early Roman, early Romans who are historians, who write history, um, are, are senators or of near senatorial status. Um, meanwhile, for other literary forms, particularly uh, drama and poetry, it is surprising to how many of our primary authors um, are really in some way uh, uh, socially uh, sort of peripheral. Um, either they come from the periphery, um, they are Italians rather than Romans proper, um, or um, in many instances they are um, socially quite marginal, including in many instances a surprising number of freed slaves. Um, uh, and so therefore, on the one hand, you know, literary production is very much a source of social mobility, um, as particularly elite patrons seek out talent um, that they can promote. Um, but this also, when we think about the problem of sort of Roman self-definition and literature as a form of, of national articulation, it's notable how much Latin literature is produced, produced by people who are really indeed on the margins, and yet they are starting to define discourses um, that will be more broadly used um, uh, by uh, Romans going forward. And of course, will inspire um, much of the literature that's, that we actually have. I mean, if you go and take Latin and then take classics, the literature that people tend to focus on is the literature of the Augustan age, another um, huge moment of, of national definition and redefinition following a devastating civil war. But it's not with the literature for people like Virgil and Ovid, um, was actually the literature that was produced in the middle and late Republic. That was what they were reading as then they go forward and produce what are oftentimes considered kind of the golden age of Latin literature. Um, that being said, our, generally one of the earliest Latin authors is a guy named Livius Andronicus. Um, we don't know that much about him to the point there's even a dispute in our sources about when he lived. It seems that he mostly uh, started writing around the 240s BC. So he's writing just in the aftermath of the 
First Punic War. Um, and uh, Livius Andronicus um, uh, is a freed slave, probably Greek. So uh, as we think about kind of slaves taking on their master's names, his, his name is probably Andronicus, a good Greek name. He's owned by someone uh, who's a member of the, the Gens Livia, and upon obtaining manumission, he becomes Livius Andronicus. Um, in terms of what he wrote, we know that he wrote um, play, so he wrote both drama, uh, tragedy, and comedy, um, and these are quite likely Latin adaptations of Greek plays rather than sort of being necessarily fully original plots. Um, but what has survived is a, a number of lines of his translation into Latin of Homer's Odyssey. Um, uh, and in some ways, this, this uh, fact, this act of translation is, is somewhat interesting um, in that the Romans, as they create their national literature, are going to rely heavily on translating the more developed literature of Greece. This is, this is uh, um, really going to be a, a, an act, you know, Roman, the development of Roman literature is largely through translation and adaptation, um, uh, even though that obviously also implies a degree of of originality as you apply it into Latin. Um, and indeed, one interesting thing about the uh, Odyssey of Livius Andronicus is he translates it, um, uh, so the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey is written in hexameter. Um, Andronicus, when he translates, use, uses a what, what is then a, a contemporary form of verse, but uh, a, a verse that is extremely native to Italy, um, namely Saturnian verse. Um, and so it's notable that in this translation, he doesn't just turn it into Latin, he turns it into the meter um, that is indeed native to Italy rather than writing in Latin in hexameters, which you can certainly do. Um, so Livius Andronicus, who again we don't know that much about, um, is, is one of the first authors, and we actually do have at least enough uh, fragments of his translation um, to, see, to, to, to see how he did it, to see both where he sort of follows Homer and where also there are flashes of originality in the choices he makes in turning it into Latin. Um, now, uh, that being said, um, the real sort of uh, burst of Latin literature is going to come uh, 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 during and immediately after the Second Punic War. Um, so another early poet who actually himself seems to be a veteran of the First Punic War is Nivius. Um, Nivius uh, uh, is active during the Second Punic War. Um, and we don't, we, we have again some fragments. It seems that his, uh, one of the things he writes is a kind of super patriotic ballad, um, among other things, describing some of the events of the First Punic War. Um, however, um, uh, what, uh, what survives of this, again, sort of first kind of efflorescence of, of Latin literature is, draw, is uh, plays, and particularly comedies. Um, uh, and the author, in fact, the er some of the earliest Latin literature that we have in complete works is Plautus. Um, and so Plautus is a playwright, um, and the plays that survive are all comedies. Um, they're, all, they're all a genre of comedy called new comedy. And it's called new comedy because um, uh, it is different from what the sort of Greeks considered old comedy. So old comedy, um, the most famous old uh, comedian is Aristophanes. It is heavily political. It is incredibly um, uh, potty mouthed, full of poop jokes and pee jokes and, and sex jokes. Um, in some ways, it, it actually kind of has a kinship, you might say, with, with the kind of rowdy body humor that you might see on a kind of Saturday Night Live. Heavily political and also pretty adult. Um, that's old comedy. New comedy developed in the early Hellenistic period. Its most famous practitioner was a guy named Menander. And new comedy tends to be um, what we might recognize as kind of situational comedy. Um, often some, somewhat genteel, uh, kind of one of the, the ends of, new of a new com comedic plot would be um, a, a couple getting married, for example. Um, so uh, Menander uh, is just one of the several practitioners of this kind of new form of comedy, much less political. Um, there are, I mean, there are jokes that, that are sort of sex jokes, but, but, but again, nowhere near as kind of scatological or, or, or uh, sexual as old comedy. Um, and Plautus, what he does is he is taking these Greek originals and then translating them into Latin. And, and here I should say he's adapting them and translating them. 
Um, uh, he's not necessarily just trying to do a word-for-word -word translation. Um, in many instances, he's adding in not just uh, um, you know, the Latin, but he's also adding in Roman references that his Roman audience would get when perhaps they might be confused with a, uh, a Greek reference. Although almost all of these are set in, um, in Greece um, uh, rather than being set in Italy. So oftentimes the characters have Greek names um, and the settings are uh, uh, various locations in Greece. So that, that, that is maintained in the adaptation. Um, now one problem in terms of, it, and, and, and you know, one thing about the plays of Plautus as being the earliest complete surviving Latin literature, we really want to use them as sources for the kind of social and cultural history of the Middle Republic. I mean, these are being produced during and just after the Second Punic War. Um, and so, you know, we were actually really interested in, okay, well, if, if Plautus says this or that, does that, what does that tell us about Roman society? The agony that we have is usually, and I think almost always, we don't have the Greek original. Um, uh, and so therefore we can't actually put them side by side and see what Plautus has changed to make it more Roman or what he hasn't changed. Um, so therefore, sometimes it's, it's hard to judge exactly what's adaptation or where Plautus is sort of making things work for a Roman audience in a Roman context. Um, but nonetheless, just the vocabulary is incredibly important because Plautus uh, is uh, actually our earliest kind of thesaurus of what Latin sounds like. Um, and so, uh, therefore, actually an incredibly important source for, for philologists and historians, um, in, in addition to being one of the earliest authors who survives in an, a large number of complete works. Um, now, Plautus, we don't know as much about him as we'd like. It's quite likely he was a freed slave. Um, another playwright who is a contemporary also, we know, is a freed slave, probably captured towards the end of the Punic War, around 200 BC. Um, uh, is a guy named Cacelius Statius. Um, Statius seems to have been an incredibly popular um, uh, playwright. Um, uh, and uh, again, also note the freed, the, the freed name. So he has the name of a major Roman plebeian gens, the gens Cacilia. Um, so Cacilia Statius. Um, Statius actually, um, well, there are plenty of people running around who are fully free, is a kind of slave name. Um, you know, someone who just stays put, stands there. Um, uh, so Cahelius Statius is a sort of junior contemporary of Ennius, um, uh, but is a really well-respected um, uh, playwright, um, even though unfortunately for us, his works don't survive. You can be popular in the Middle Republic and for some reason, you know, a monk in the eighth century forgets to translate, or forgets to copy your work and the mice eat it and it's gone. That's just the way manuscript work for us. Um, uh, now, uh, Perhaps the most um, uh, prominent of all of the poets um, in the immediate aftermath of the Second Punic War is a guy named Aeneas. Um, now, Aeneas is a free man. He's, he's not a freed slave, um, but he is Italian. He is, his uh, first language is Oscan. Um, he actually talks about how he has three hearts, Oscan, Greek, and Latin. So he's someone who is multilingual, multicultural, um, it's quite likely that he served uh, with Roman armies as an Italian Socius uh, during the Second Punic War. Um, and uh, either late in the war or immediately after the war is able to find patrons, possibly even Cato the Elder, um, who bring him to Rome. Um, although he very quickly develops a very close association with the Scipio family. Um, uh, and it seems a friendship, particular friendship with Scipio Africanus. And indeed, I think one important thing to note about the, the role of all of these kind of marginal peoples, um, in many instances, they are not just kind of breaking it in on their own. They are, of course, mobilizing their, their talent and their, their, their genius, but in many instances, they are identified and nurtured uh, by powerful aristocratic patrons. And this in itself is an important point. It does seem that at this time, part of the kind of social capital of Roman aristocrats is, do you have a number of artists that you can a call on if, say, you know, your nephew is an edile and he's overseeing a festival and he needs some good talent? Um, uh, and you know, remember that, that, that these, these plays are mostly being performed at various ludi, various festivals. Um, 
and uh, uh, you know some of the glory of putting on a really good show accrues to the magistrates who are running the festival, the plebeian or the cool ediles, um, uh, primarily. Um, so aristocrats are patronizing artists in part because it helps them work their way up the cursus norum. It also seems that just more broadly, having these guys in your orbit, coming to your dinner parties, uh, you know, sitting around and drinking and talking, having urbane conversation, is also just part of the broader social and cultural capital of being a Roman elite. Um, so um, uh, Ennius uh, arrives at Rome somewhat after the Second Punic War and establishes himself as uh, another, again, really uh, prominent, maybe one of the most prominent of poets. He produces tragedies and comedies, um, but uh, the work that it perhaps defines him, which only again survives in fragments and little quotations in other authors, is a super patriotic epic um, a poem about Rome's recent history, um, uh, uh, its military, its military glories. Uh, it seems to primarily focus on the Second Punic War, um, uh, although it does seem to include at least some discussion of earlier events, maybe even up into the, uh, the Pyrrhic Wars uh, in, the, in the 270s BC. Um, and then it goes all the way down to Ennius's um, uh, uh, being enfranchised. Ennius, again, who was not a Roman citizen, is enrolled in a citizen colony. This is a kind of Back, backdoor way of becoming a Roman citizen, and it, this is actually kind of how Ennius ends his annales. Uh, now again, we only have fragments. Um, uh, it, the the annales are sort of unfortunately notable for what we're missing versus what we have. Um, oftentimes, a fragment is selected for preservation simply because a later author said, "Wow, this is a weird, archaic word. Let's preserve the sentence." Um, so you know, God, we 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 like like kill for you know one book of the annales. Um, nonetheless, what stands out is how just, again, super patriotic um, Ennius is. Uh, everything that we have suggests that he is fully invested in the Roman uh, national and imperial project. Um, uh, and, and, and so in some ways, that's, that, and that seems to have been the same with Naivius, um, uh, uh, super patriotic um, poems. Um, uh, and we also know that, it, that some of the plays that, that Ennius writes also, uh, in addition to having kind of Greek adaptations of tragedies or comedies, um, uh, are, celebrate Roman military victories. Um, one other genre that doesn't, we, we know he wrote in it, but it doesn't survive, uh, a kind of native Roman genre, is satire, um, uh, uh, satura, um, is, uh, which, sort of, which is also sort of um, a bunch of little stuff kind of stuck together, um, uh, kind of a miscellany or potpourri um, that sort of develops into sort of a series of poems that criticize people or society. Um, it seems that Ennius is part of the early development of that, although the greatest of the uh, Republican satirists, the, great, the, the, the satirist who survives uh, and is perhaps the most famous for the imperial period is Juvenal. Um, uh, Horace also survives, wrote a number of satires, but the greatest, those are all imperial era poets, the greatest uh, Republican era satirist um, who survives, in, uh, some of him survives at least, is a guy named Lucilius, who's active more in the, the late second century, probably around the 130s, 120s BC. Um, so we do see there the, the, the development between Aeneas and Lucilius so of, again, what we might kind of describe as a more uh, native Italian type of literature, not just translating, adapting Greek plots and models, but um, a, a poem that, that you know, may be somewhat, or a set of poems that may be somewhat more original. Um, now, uh, later in the century, uh, in the 160s, we have another playwright who importantly survives also, and that is Terence. Um, uh, and indeed, we're told that uh, Cacilius Statius, um, uh, who in late in life, um, approved of a number of plays, or at least at least one play of Terence that he um, uh, reviewed. Um, Terence uh, seems, uh, uh, again, his, his status isn't entirely clear. At the very least, it seems to initially be a foreigner. He comes from North Africa. Um, at least one description describes him as having woolly hair, um, which, of course, has led inevitably uh, people in the 20th or 21st century to wonder, um, you know, thinking about our own racial silos, was Terence black? Um, I, again, that category simply doesn't exist in the 2nd century BC, so we don't know. 
Um, famously, the uh, 18th century American poetess, a freed uh, a black uh, woman living in uh, the North, Phyllis Wheatley, um, seems to have drawn uh, considerable inspiration from Terence and actually sort of saw herself as a later day Terence. Um, but I, we can still say with Terence is that he was um, uh, marginal, uh, he came, comes from abroad, um, and he may have at least looked slightly diff different from the way um, that a standard Roman looked. He nonetheless writes a number of blockbuster plays, which were, for whatever reason, later on considered so good that they were copied and copied and survived. And so together, Plautus and Terence um, provide us with some of our best evidence, not just for Middle Republican literature, um, but actually for new comedy period. Now, very few of the Greek originals survive. Uh, they found a few bits of Menander on Papyrus, but most of what we know about new comedy comes from Plautus and Terence. Incidentally, most of what Elizabethan authors knew about comedy, when they thought, what should a comedy look like? They, they weren't reading Aristophanes. They couldn't read Menander, but they generally had enough Latin that they could approach Plautus and Terence. And so um, William Shakespeare, when he thinks, well, what is a comedy? In many ways, he's going to be much more influenced by um, Plautus and Terence than he would be um, by, say, uh, Aristophanes. That, those kind of Latin drawing room comedies um, have, a, have a sort of direct line, <laughs> direct genealogy with what you might find in the, in the Elizabethan or Shakespearean um, comedy. Um, so that's just an overview of some of our early sort of Middle, Latin, Middle Republican Latin authors. Um, really quickly, it's worth just talking about history in kind of the last five minutes. Um, uh, so the first history of Rome, written by a Roman, uh, is written around the year 200 BC by a Roman senator named Fabius Pictor. One really important thing, Fabius Pictor writes in Greek. He's not yet a Latin historian. Um, and it may be that he writes in Greek, well, for a couple of reasons. One, it may be that he sees himself, he's someone who had engaged in diplomatic activities to the Greeks. Um, it may be that he wants to sort of help to explain the, the Roman past to Greek audiences. But at this point, history, written by people like Thucydides, Thucydides and Herodotus and Xenophon, um, may be seen as a fundamentally Greek genre. And if you were going to write it, well, you would write in Greek too, wouldn't you? Um, so um, our first history of Rome, which survives again only in tiny fragments, although a source for Polybius, we know that Polybius is using Pictor because he, he tells us this, um, uh, but Fabius Pictor is our first Roman history, uh, historian. Um, now, uh, uh, a author that does survive, or some of his work survive, uh, is uh, Cato the Elder. Um, Cato the Elder, um, uh, is a senator. He's a senator who has his own fascinating cultural agenda, but uh, even though he's a tremendously well-read in Greek literature, he takes a stand against all things Greek. Kind of part of his public persona is a dislike of Greek things and a desire to kind of resist Greek influences on Roman culture. Um, again, Cato protests too much in, in this, um, but Cato was very interested in writing a history in Latin, um, and therefore, he wrote a, a, a history in Latin, supposedly as a, um, a kind of educational aid for his son. Um, this, uh, uh, unfortunately, does not survive, um, but it does seem that Cato's history um, is a kind of uh, turning point in creating the idea that history in Latin should be its own literary genre. Um, uh, now, uh, in some ways, perhaps influenced by Aeneas, um, subsequent historians by the middle of the second century BC um, are, remember Aeneas' poem is called the Annales. It's organized consular year by consular year. Um, and by the middle of the second century BC, this does seem to be the standard way in which Latin historians are organizing their histories. Um, uh, Cato's own history, which basically starts from the founding of the city, um, is called the Origines. Um, and it's unclear that it had an analytic uh, organization. Although again, not much survives, just a few tiny fragments. Um, but um, again, most Roman histories going forward are going to be analytic histories. Um, and uh, again, we have some of these historians like um, uh, Aquilius and Antipater, 
um, uh, Claudius Quadrigatus, um, eventually Valerius Antius. Um, uh, this is a tradition that, again, mostly survives in fragments, but the second century analysts um, will be heavily used by Livy, um, who remains one of our most important sources. Oftentimes, what Livy knows, Livy also organizes his history in an analytic fashion, but what Livy knows year by year comes from variously, uh, he's, he's used Polybius, he's used Cato the Elder, um, uh, but a lot of it comes from second century analysts um, who have all, already organized their history year by year. All right, this is just a little taste of uh, Latin literature in the Middle Republic, um, uh, but um, it is, I think, notable that this period of time as Rome's in, in, uh, external conquests explode is also a moment of profound literary self-definition, and I suspect those two things go hand in hand. Um, all right, we'll talk some more next, later this week about um, just what the heck's going on in the second century BC and how even in a moment of triumph, maybe Rome's social problems are starting to pop back up again. Uh, see you soon.